From its beginning, organic farming has rejected the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. While it also encourages the use of soil organic amendments, crop rotation, and biological pest control, all these practices are also used by non-organic farmers. It is this ban on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that is organic farming's key distinction. The ban is comprehensive. All uses and all rates of these materials are prohibited. The specifics of each material do not matter, only whether they are synthetic or not. Science, however, is all about the specifics. Rate, location, timing, crop or non-crop use, toxicity, longevity, hazard, and risk. As determined through careful research, these important details allow us to rationally make evidence-based decisions. And that is what science has been doing for the past 75 years. Some chemicals were found to be so dangerous or detrimental to the environment that they were banned completely. Others were restricted to specific uses or application rates. Better chemicals have been developed. Application technology and applicator safety equipment and procedures have all been improved. Although this process is not perfect, over time, through many steps and by the work of many people, it has allowed us to make incremental improvements in our use of these materials. During the same time, organic farming's ban on these materials has remained comprehensive and inflexible. Furthermore, it has expanded to include all uses of all genetically modified crops. When synthetic fertilizers and pesticides were first introduced, farming without them was a reasonable hypothesis. After 75 years of scientific advancement, it is no longer so reasonable, and it is not a hypothesis. So what is it? It is an ideology, a settled, inflexible belief. It has persisted unchanged for over 75 years because of the simple, enticing idea that it is best to farm naturally. The danger is that people mistake this alluring, powerful idea for reality. Although the accumulated scientific evidence does not support such a comprehensive ban, over the past few decades the scientific community has incrementally embraced organic farming. The USDA funds organic farming research. Researchers investigate it and top-tier journals publish their results. Universities support organic farming majors and certified organic farms. And extension and professional organizations hold sessions on organic farming. This embrace is not just of crop rotation or a focus on soil quality, but includes the ideology. And because the ideology is rarely challenged, for all intents and purposes, science and education are being guided by it. And there is the main problem. Because the goal of organic farming is not to find the best solutions, but only those solutions that are within its ideology. In education, we teach students that certain potential solutions, those that do not fit in the ideology, are off limits. My question is why? Why are we doing this? Why would we give up on the scientific process that has served us so well for so long? Why are we yielding to ideology over scientific evidence? Have we lost our trust in science? On February 26th of 1998, Gene Kahn, founder of Cascadian Farms, Organic Foods, and Small Planet Foods, founding member of the National Organic Standards Board, and later Vice President of Sustainable Development for General Mills, said this, Organics is a way of life. It's a belief system, if you will. Our traditions do not need to be scrutinized by the so-called scientific approach. He was commenting on the proposed National Organic Standards. I agree with Gene Kahn. Science should not be used to scrutinize people's traditions and belief systems. But within science, we must, must strive, as far as it is possible, to assure that our work is not biased by those same traditions and belief systems. We must be able to acknowledge the benefits of organic farming without accepting its ideology.